session is probably one of those sessions you think, whoa, what are they going to land up saying now? We've heard so much already. And, um, but I must say that I have a great amount of joy in my heart sharing these last things with you. I'm not going to wrap it up. I'm not going to land it. I'm going to launch it. So I've done this a little bit differently for this afternoon. We're going to do a countdown together through the points. So my first point is actually point number 10. So we're going to go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, so that you know how far I'm going, so you stay awake, you stay connected. So whenever you see that number coming up just now, then you can shout out that number. Is that okay? Yeah. And then right at the end when we're finished, we're going to graduate, and then we're going to throw our cap back up in the sky. I don't know if there'll be another photo for that one, but just to celebrate everything that God has done during this time. It's been our absolute privilege to host this time. It's, it's been a highlight for us personally as a church as well to be able to welcome people from different parts of the world. Little did we know when we planted here nearly 15 years ago that we'd be able to host something like this. But here we are today, and it's a great and awesome privilege just to welcome you, have you part of everything. It's been an absolute joy. You know, I don't, I don't feel wiped out. I feel refreshed. I feel ignited. I feel like, hey, God's doing something pretty awesome here that's, that's beyond our natural ability to cope with and to deal with. But His grace is upon us. He's working through us. And it's an incredible joy to, to see your faces. I see many faces that we've met around over the years. And it's just a great and wonderful joy to be on this journey together. Thank you for coming, taking the time, paying the money, staying in faith, uh, getting, paying the price. I think the guys are coming from certain countries with an exchange rate of 20 to 1. I think, like, I don't know how you do it, but you're here. Thank you for coming. And uh, the distances, leaving families behind and coming here with your kids as well. What a wonderful testimony of what God is doing in our midst. So we celebrate with you and we enjoy this time together. And um, the, pic the picture that I had before I want to start is of Jesus invading our space. And there's a number of times that I see in the New Testament where Jesus arrives unannounced, actually uninvited too. And uh, there was a time in the Bible where uh, his disciples were in a room. You remember the story? And Jesus just walks through the wall. He didn't knock. He didn't respond to an invitation. But they were probably gathering together in expectation. They weren't quite sure what was going to happen. But as far as I read, they were locked up in this place. They were afraid and fearful because of everything that had happened. It was around the crucifixion of Jesus. And he just came straight through the wall. Because in that room, there were doubters. There were people who were afraid. There were people that maybe had questions. How can... How can this all happen to our Lord and to our Savior? How can that happen? Who knows what all the questions were that were rumbling in that room. But Jesus came through that wall. And the picture that I had is that Jesus is going to go through some of those things that, are, that have been barriers over the years. Where he's going to come unannounced and uninvited and he's going to surprise us. I think Jesus loves surprise parties. Where he just comes through that wall and says, through all your doubts, through all your fears, through all your worries and anxieties, where's Jesus? And then Jesus is just going to arrive and he's going to say like, Whoa, like that song says, what are you going to do when Jesus comes in the room? And I was singing that song, and I went, whoa, Jesus gonna, you know, what am I going to do? I'll be honest with you, I don't know what I'll do, but I probably will hug him. I'll probably cry, I'll laugh, I'll jump. I don't know what I'll do. But even thinking of what I would do if Jesus walked to the room, it would be overwhelmingly beautiful and powerful. And I just feel like he's wanting to have those intimate encounters with you. For some of you, you're Zacchaeus up in the tree, and he says, come down, I'm coming to your house tonight, and invite your friends. He wasn't invited. He created his own opportunity to arrive. And there are other occasions as well where Jesus arrives on the scene and reveals something of who he is and the nature of who he is. And it does something in the hearts of people because he knows where we're at and what's happening, the circumstances and events that are happening and saying like, no, there's a group of people I'm going to leave behind you that need to be launched into their future. And I'm saying, Jesus, come and invade this space. Come and invade our churches. Come and invade our, our homes. Come and invade our work opportunities. Wherever we find ourselves in this world, come, Jesus, come and invade. Where the walls are up and the barriers are up, I'm just saying, Jesus, would you just come through those things? In our ignorance, sometimes those things exist. 
but I believe that he's just wanting to break in and come and reveal more of himself. So we're going through this wonderful theme the whole week based around the book of Daniel, and um, it's amongst some of my favorite stories because some of the craziest things happen in those, in those stories and in those chapters that we read. But we're dealing like never before with moral issues and gender issues and ethic issues and humanistic ideology and philosophies, political persuasions and agendas, wars, famines, natural disasters, etc. Is that saying nothing joyful that we can say like, ooh ha. <laughs> and even as the book of John says that the spirit of the Antichrist is already among you. Nothing to lift the joy in the house. But it's an environment for the church to shine and to blossom and to be a pillar of truth and hope for the now and the future generations. What I hope to pass on to you today in this last session, and I trust will help you navigate your way forward, is please don't lose the way forward. There is so much stuff that's just coming at us at such a pace, as Alan said, it's just like going faster and faster and faster. And it can be overwhelming. How do we navigate our way through into the future? And I'm asking as well because I get into those conversations where people begin to ask those questions that are sometimes difficult to answer on faith. Where is God in all this? Very critical questions that we're dealing with in our day and age. And I'm asking, please don't lose the way. And I'm hoping the countdown that I'm going to give you is going to help you to navigate not to lose the way. Because I want you to keep, and my prayer is to keep your focus on Jesus. If we lose that, we're going to lose our way. If the church loses its focus on Jesus, it's going to lose its way. He is the head of the church. He is our Jesus. If we start focusing on other things, we're going to lose the way. As enthusiastic as we can be, and as many programs as we can have in place, and all the excellence about everything, if we lose the one who it's all about, we are going to lose our way. And so my heartbeat for you today is pick up on some of these things as a countdown into the future. I'm not saying this is the end all of everything, but just some things to help you and to equip you to say, yes, I want to go back to those things, remind myself of those things so that we don't lose the way forward. So here we go. I hope um, this works. It's a big button, right? Okay, here we go. I don't want to go backwards. I want to go forwards. Okay, there we go. Okay, it's still not happening. I might have just push the power button on. That's a good one. Thanks. Okay, let's try again. Okay, bzzz, I heard something. I'll try again. There we go. Yeah. Ten. Ten. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. I get this prophetic picture from Craig, my friend, about visions. My first point. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18 is for me a key scripture in the way forward. Now, I'm going to give you a couple here of translations. Um, Read with me, if you want. It's up there. But the NIV NIV says, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. The English Standard Version says, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. The King James Bible says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. The Good News translation says, a nation without God's guidance is a nation without order. Happy are those who keep God's law. The Amplified Bible says, where there is no vision or no revelation of God and His Word, the people are unrestrained, but happy and blessed is he who keeps the law of God. The Living Bible says, where there is ignorance of God, crime runs wild. But what a wonderful thing it is for the nation to know and keep his laws. The message says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. And for me, this word vision was something that really just came to the surface, even in preparation for this time. It's like when you've got the blinkers in front of you, not even on the sides anymore, just the blinkers in front of you. If there's no vision, you're going to lose your way forward. Vision for me here is not just about a nice vision for a building project or for your work or for your ministry, whatever else. Vision here, when you go and look at the original meaning of that word, it actually speaks about a revelation of God. So we're not sure about packing out like, hey, what's your vision for your life and your vision for your church? No, this thing is no revelation of God, you're in trouble. 
If you put it in Dutch, I don't want to put it in Dutch, but I'll let you think and fill that word for yourself. But I'm just saying that if we don't have a revelation of God and His Word, there's going to be a lot of running around, people doing unrestrained things. There are things that are going to be happening that's going to be wild, and you're going to think like, is that still the church, or is that still my believing friends? That somehow they've lost their way because the revelation of God is not real for them. And I say it time and time again as well, when it comes to this thing of how do we enter the kingdom of God, it's only when you're born again. I'm sorry. I was born in a Christian, half Christian family, half unbelieving family. My dad was church going, my mother wasn't. And yet at nine years old, I didn't have a visual vi vision of Jesus, but the revelation came in, I need Jesus in my life. And with a group of friends sitting in a bungalow at a scripture union getaway, we gave our lives to Christ. 57 years old, and I want to celebrate when I'm 59, when I can say 50 years I've been serving the Lord. And by His grace, He has carried me thus far, because even David said, how is it that we got this far? And I'm thinking like, no, I want to reflect on the grace of God that has carried me to this point, kept me married, kept me sane, kept me in the call of God, kept my focus on it, and I'm saying, God, this is not about all my good achievements, or all my good deeds, or all my goody, goody, goodies. It's about you. It's about your grace carrying me every day of my life. But it comes from a revelation of Christ, and if that's not there, you won't sacrifice. You won't get connected. You won't live for Him 100%. That vision that this part of Scripture is talking about is about Him. It's not about all good plans and dreams and whatever else that you have. It's about Him. Where there is no revelation, people will cast off restraint. But blessed is He who keeps the law. So in this other time of history, we see in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, it says, The child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. There was nothing. There was no revelation of God being talked about, but a prophet was raised up in his time, a young little boy called by God while he was sleeping. Hey, I hear something. What's that? Go to Eli. What's happening? Go back to Eli. What's happening? I don't know what's happening. Go back to sleep. Okay, if you hear it again, maybe it's God that's speaking. I think maybe sometimes young people can be like that. They, they're looking for an answer, but they don't know where to find it. And yet as adults, we can try and help them and say, like, actually, just go. Maybe God's speaking. And now we can respond. But there was no open vision in that day. There was no revelation of God, and yet the Word of God came through Samuel, and he brought his revelation to a nation that was in dire straits. A wonderful way of seeing how God works. This word vision is the same one that is referenced in Proverbs 29, 18. Likewise, the same word was to introduce the prophetic books like Isaiah 1, 1. Same word in Obadiah 1, 1. And some of the visions that Daniel had, same word is used and described there about the oracles of God, the uh, revelation of God and who He is and His laws. In actual fact, in the same word is used 34 times in different prophetic books. I guess it's pretty important to have vision. Otherwise, we're going to run wild and we will not have direction. So, vision, revelation, and the prophetic word for me is wrapped up in that one word, vision. Have vision, have a revelation, and the prophetic nowness of God's word coming to us. So, let's carry on. We're nearly getting to the countdown, all right? This is my longest point. Hang in there. So, vision brings clarity. It brings focus and direction and is important. Habakkuk 2 says, Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation. Write down what? Good ideas? Good plans? No, write down the revelation. Who is God? What does His law say? Write that down. And it says here, uh, whoa, okay, I've lost my place. Here we go. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that the herald may run with it. Again, this word revelation is the same word that is used in Proverbs chapter 29. Can you imagine being that herald? And you're going around with these tablets and like somebody gives you this tablet with things written on it. And you go running around to the different villages because that's what they did. They were like newspaper guys. They, what, they were, if there was a newspaper issue or there was information that needed to be spread out in the country, the heralds would run with that thing. And can you imagine the herald gets to the first city and says like, ah, 
whoa, I can't even, what's written here? I can't even, wow. let me turn it around, upside down. It's not clear. What am I going to say to these people? It's not clear. Well, let me just make up something then. I don't know. To impress the people that are listening so that they think like, wow, this is something that's come from God, but actually it's come from a human being and not from Him. It needs to be clear. Who is God? Is the question that's been asked a lot in our generation. Who is He? Where is He? Is He still here? Is He still loving? Is He still kind? Is He still involved? Or is He distant and far away? Vision is so vitally important in all of this. Vision creates an unstoppable passion, it's up there, to honor God in all His ways. Vision creates unity and oneness. And I love that thing that you shared yesterday, Joel, just about the unity of the generations. When we have a revelation of who God is, it's so much easier to work together because we serve the same Lord, the same God, the same Jesus, and He's about the same thing, wanting to work through the same people, the same heart, same voice, one voice, one-mindedness. Vision helps us with that and creates oneness. Vision creates momentum in our lives. It keeps vi uh, focus on the one, sorry, vision keeps the focus on the main one. Jesus, I love this in the book of John, the one and only. There's no one like him. They've stolen that in boxing rings. And in this corner we have uh, LBs and he's done so many fights and whatever. And he's knocked out so many guys. And, uh, the one and only. And then they shout out his name. And I'm thinking like, no, dude, there's only one, one and only. You've stolen something out of our Bible and you're referencing it to a human being who's going to get knocked out anyway. Vision also reminds me who it's about and for who I'm living for. Vision brings me back to the word of the Lord, the revelation of God, hunger for his word. I want to say, God, imprint that on my heart and on my mind and on my soul and on my spirit. That I'm not just doing good things, but God inspired and God guided things. Without clear vision, we end up doing something else. Often something that is self-satisfying and may seem like a good idea and the right thing to do, but it distracts us from the one and only. Ah, vision helps me to trim and prune the clutter and keep the focus. When you have a revelation of God, He will also reveal some things about you. <laughs> I don't need a revelation about myself, Lord. We just want about you. No, well, if God loves you too much to leave you the way that you are. And so that means that sometimes branches need to be trimmed and those, we had roses that were been trimmed and whatever, something like, no, don't trim that off. But I've also heard about farming is that often they trim off the most fruitful branches. Thinking like, oh, Lord, I don't, no, where's that going to go? Oh, oh, what's happening there, Lord, whatever else. Now God's just saying, man, I've got your future in mind as well. Not just your past and what led you to this point, but actually I've got something in mind for your future. Vision gives me hope for tomorrow. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. You can carry on singing. <laughs> I know, yes, I know, he holds the future. And life. Sing it again, help me. Because he lives, I can face too. Yes, Lord. All fear is gone. Because I know yes, I know He holds the future. And life is worth the living just because He lives. Thank you, Lord. Honestly. I don't know what the right word is, but we, we're in serious trouble without Him. I don't know how I got this far without Jesus. And just thinking like, Lord, you're real. You're not just written in a book or sung about, but you're real. You live within me by your Spirit. 
I don't know how I can face tomorrow without the knowledge that He is there and He is welcoming me into my future and into His purposes and plans for my life because He lives. He's not dead, He's alive and He's real. Vision helps me understand who God is and my identity as a child of God. Vision will determine how you live. No revelation, you're going to carry on like a religious freak. Sorry, I just put that in there. Vision takes you into your destiny, <laughs> takes you into your inheritance. Your vision determines who you fix your eyes on. Be thou my vision. Okay, I don't know the rest of the song, but anyway. <laughs> we'll get you guys crying this time, not me. But be thou my vision. Vision sets us apart with the called out ones because we have a revelation of who he is. A powerful, magnificent, glorious God living in us and through His church. Vision is prophetic. It's like the oracles of God are coming down and saying, this is my heart for you. This is my heart for your future. This is my heart for the nations. I'm sharing my revelation with you. I'm sharing my vision with you so that you can be the heralds that can take this thing without confusion, what we believe in, who we believe in, so that we don't know what's written here. No, I have a conviction. I know who He is. I know what His Word says about these things. Let me be clear, it's written here, very clearly. Hear he, hear he. And off you go. I remember that line because I once did a play at school as in a matric. And I, that was my line. Hear he, hear he. And then I walked off the stage again. Still dealing with hurt. And I had to wear these long socks and this puffy pants and a feather in my hat and whatever else. Hear he, hear he. Anyway. <laughs> How did I get there? Vision is prophetic. Vision causes me to make a sacrifice. Vision is a divine revelation. Vision comes by the Spirit of God. I can't get it out anywhere else. Vision comes by the Spirit of God. He revealed himself to, who was that guy, Craig? <laughs> to Paul. He revealed himself to Paul. But he also made it very clear that actually, I don't even know what I want to say here. But anyway, he was revealing himself to people in the Bible in a way that they could not walk away from that moment and think like, oh, I just saw a ghost. But I touched him. I saw him. I had a barbecue with fish on the ocean with him. I saw him. I saw his eyes. I was in his presence. Didn't he warm our hearts? We live by revelation of God and His worth. His truth, the rock, Jesus, the truth. This is our foundation, that place where we find the absolute truth for all that we are dealing with in our generation to come. You want an answer on anything, on anything, it's in His word. But if it's just black and white and it doesn't carry the spirit and the heart of God, we're just going to be giving intellectual answers that are not going to change people's lives. People are saying out there, I have my own truth. Scary stuff. But they're moving away from the truth to satisfy their own lifestyle needs, their tickling ears, and everything that they want to do for themselves. His word determines my values, my principles, my views, my opinions, my norms by which we as the human race should be living. More so, we as believers use the word of God as the ultimate and final say on all matters. So some of the th words that come up here in this particular one long point, we're going to get to number nine, don't worry. Casting off restraint is the result when you don't have vision. You're unrestrained. You're wild. You're running loose. You're found naked, the Bible says. There's no order. You'll be scattered. It will be breached. There's a break loose, and you'll perish, and you'll die. The good news is that actually when it comes to the second part of that scripture, it talks about being blessed, about being happy, about being joyful, and in another part of the scripture there, it says, keepeth his soul. And I just think like, man, on the other side is that when we have the vision, we are going to be happy. We're going to be blessed. So that's the good news about Jesus will make you happy. And I'm not saying that's, uh, that's where it stops, the full stop. No, life carries on. But this thing of like, I have found exactly what I'm looking for. In the words of that one band. And I just think like, we found what we're looking for. And that brings me the joy and the peace that actually people were talking about over this week, that gap that exists in the human heart yeah. that only God can fill. I can say like Jesus, I have discovered. Yeah. 
that you're more than a gap filler, but you are my Lord and you're my Savior and you are my everything. I don't need all this other stuff. I'm in this world, but I'm not of it. I will walk through this world and sometimes my feet might get muddy and dirty and dusty, but I'm not of this world. I'm in this world. And I want to be an, a bearer of that who you are. Not to try and define you in words, but out of a revelation that I have and bring that through to the rest of the people around me. Psalm 1 comes to mind. Blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of living water, sorry, of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Joel 2, verse 28 comes to mind. And afterwards, I will pour out my spirit and all people, on all people, sorry, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. You know what? That's what they say when you turn 50. Now you can start dreaming, Craig. <laughs> old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions. Do you know what that word vision actually happens to mean? It's a revelation of who he is. So when I read this, I read it through a different set of glass. I said like, yes, they're going to have it. That generation where this is going to happen more and more, where we see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit coming, the, the guys are going to be dreaming. And even the word dream, if you look at its explanation, there's the word revelation in there as well. But there's young men who are going to have visions. In other words, they have received this revelation. They carry the oracles, the prophetic words of God. And actually, one of the demonstrations of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will be a generation that is going to run wild in the right way. With the fire of Christ within them, with the revelation of who He is, and the Word of God firmly grounded in them, that when they speak, the Holy Spirit will come in a more and more significant and powerful way. So for me, one of the fruits of this thing of vision is that this for me is the hope of our future, that actually the one generation is passing it on to the next generation. Sorry that I'm speaking so fast. <laughs> but anyway, thank you to the translators that are sitting up there being very gracious with us, guys. Uh, thank you so much. This gives me hope for our future, to know that there's going to be a generation that are going to take this thing very seriously and be the carriers and the heralds of this revelation, this vision that's coming and has possibly already come in more ways than one. So, that was the introduction. None. None. Now I'm just going to read things and we'll go faster this way. We've got five more minutes to get through nine points. Be transformed or live within the reality of being conformed. Romans 12, 1 to 2 says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform. To the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need a scrub, not a, also a wash probably. I don't know what it is, but we need to be transformed. Yeah. More like Christ in our thinking. So then you will be able. Then you will be mature enough to see what is right and what is wrong, but also be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. I'll let the Bible speak for itself. Eight. Okay, be fulfilled and satisfied in the Lord only. There's this continuous pursuit for happiness and satisfaction and this world of perfection. I want to say to you at the end of the day, one thing I can give forward to you as a bit of advice for somebody that's walked the road is you're not going to find it in anything else except the Lord. That's it. So the pursuit of happiness, is, is it's okay to be happy in your work and happy in whatever else. But if that's the ambition of your life, to continuously go and look for things that are going to make you happy, you're going to waste a lot of your time and a lot of your money. That's why the Bible says, get what's for free in this next verse. It says, why spend your money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? And just before that, it says, I come to me. It's free. I've got bread. I've got milk. I've got everything you need. Why go and spend all your time and your money on those things that are so temporary and are not going to fulfill the thing that you're actually looking for and that thing you can only find in me? So, so I'll be fulfilled and satisfied in the Lord. Okay, we're doing well, guys. Seven. 
All right, serve the purposes of God in your generation. To the older generation, wherever you find yourself as the oldie or the youngie. But to the older generation, be the Joshua. The 80 to 82 plus year old who crossed the Jordan. He wasn't a teen, just to let you know, when he crossed the Jordan. He was 80 plus. Some of us maybe forget that point. And yet he went in and he fought. And even Caleb, right often, we need some more Caleb's. That are going to say, like, I'm not looking for a time and age. I'm looking for the purposes of God. I'm wanting to pursue my inheritance and the call of God upon my life. Isaiah 55. Oh, no. What are we saying here? No, next one. Okay. We're in another one. All right. Abraham was prepared to leave his home and family to follow God. He was old. Be the Moses. He was 80 years old to lead God's people. Every generation needs us. We all have been called to serve the purposes of God in our generation. It was a song at my wedding. I want to serve the purposes of God in my generation. I know you're all looking at me. It goes back to the 80s. (laughs) 90s. Gee, I nearly forgot when I was married. Anyway. At least I don't forget people's names in the Bible. Okay. Each generation needs each other. As has been said, the younger generation has the youthfulness and the energy, and we have the experience and the theology. We both need each other. To the younger generation, we need the Jonathan types who will climb up the cliff face with his armor bearer against all odds and say, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. We need the Esthers for such a time as this. We need the David types who will stand up against the insults and intimidation And the generated fears that come from the voice of the Goliaths of our generation and attempting to enslave us under the ideologies and philosophies and the prideful exalting themselves above and against the name of God and His Word. They don't have revelation. A whole army was paralyzed with fear and were submitting themselves to the loudest voice. Don't give yourself to that voice. We need the rooftops. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. We need the Isaiah types. Here am I, send me. We need the Samuel types. Speak, for your servant is listening. We need more Jesus-hearted types. Not my will, but your will be done. He only did what he saw the Father doing, and only said what he heard the Father saying. Cool, we're going fast. Six, don't forfeit your soul. Let's read the passage of Scripture. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. You want to live? We do. Then you need to die. You want to receive? You must give. Everything works around a different way in the kingdom of God. You really want to live? You have to die. And actually say, yes, I will live for him and none other. That's where you find true life. Five. Okay. Share your testimony. And I've got all of one or two minutes left. What altars are we building for the next generation? On different occasions in the Old Testament, there were altars of stone that were built to testify what had taken place, declaring the way that they hid. A memorial, Joshua 4 verse 6, to serve as a sign. It says here, to serve as a sign amongst you in the future when your children ask you, what do these stones mean, tell them. And what I wrote down here is like, what do I want to leave behind for the next generation? But I also want to ask the, the, the younger generation, what do you want to find when you get to this altar of our stories and our testimonies and what God has done and what He's saying into our future? What do you long to find there? Because then leave that behind for the guys that are falling behind you as well. We'll see that, as was said, that God is a God of generations, and He mentions often four generations. That means your great children, great, great, whatever, the fourth guys that are coming along. They are going to need something of a testimony of who is God and what has He said and what is He doing. 
In Judges 2, we see, unfortunately, a whole generation after Joshua fading away because the Bible says they knew not God always ways. And I think, like, how is that possible that they saw all the magnificent things that God had done? And they're in the promised land and in the inheritance and in the middle of all this glory and wonderful milk and honey, they lost their way. A whole generation fell away. I think, like, how is that possible? That when Joshua died, this generation that rose up, that knew not God or his way, they may have forgotten to take their children past those altars of the testimonies of what God has said and done. Good, eh? I'm going to flesh through them. Be unashamed. Be strong and courageous. Three. Courage is a radical obedience in the face of what scares you to death. It's not pulling back, but it's pressing into your fears, not denying them. Courage is about letting go of all your excuses. Stop settling and start living more boldly and bravely. It takes courage to make big decisions. And a good old president from the United States says, what counts is not necessarily the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog that counts. Dream big. Fight brave. It takes courage. And I heard the guys talked about it yesterday. Two, stand your ground. Whoa, we're not going to read this, but stay faithful as we see in the book of Daniel, where we just see through every moment they were able to deal with the issues that were facing me. I think there are some heroes that are missing in that book. The parents, the village that raised them. The people that invested into their lives to help them understand who God is. They had a revelation of who God was. They invested in their kids. And Daniel and his mates were able to live in a, in a Babylonian society for decades. They always stood their ground. They remained faithful. They knew who God was. They had that revelation and they lived it out. They remained faithful. They did not bow down to the idols of that age. They did not dance to the music that was surrounding the idolatry of that age. They say, we're not going to dance to the music of this world. Can you imagine three guys standing in a crowd of thousands? You just hear the dust going down. <laughs> dust everywhere. And the guys are happy because now they're playing their music and there's big idols coming down. And Nebuchadnezzar, oh, that's me up there, whatever else. And the dust settles and all of a sudden there's three Hebrew guys there just like, hey, what's that thing? Yeah, you know? yeah. Oh, no, 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 we're not bowing down to that thing. Hey, into the fire, whatever else. You know the whole story. But they remained faithful. They would not bow down to the idolatry or to the music that was being played from the world at that time. Are you ready? I don't have any fantastic slide to finish this off. But maybe you can just grab your hat and do a last celebration of thanking God for what He has said and what He has done and who He is. And you know what they do at graduation? Hey, they've got these big cloaks on. You've been at an equip. This thing of me preaching here was not to land it, it was to launch you. And to say, please take what you've heard over these times, over these days, take it with you wherever you go. And be that person that God designed you to be, live in that revelation, and take it into the world that we're going to go. So, we had, we had 10, huh? Oh, here we go, okay. Should we just go from 10 again? Right. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one, go! <laughs> God bless you.